I'm Matt Wisniewski here with Kathleen Johnson from the House History Office. Today's date is May 15th, 2015, and we're here with Congresswoman Ava Clayton to talk about her career in Congress. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Delighted to be here. Yeah. We thought we'd start off with some questions about uh, the origins of, of your interest in politics to start. Um, and first off, when you were young, we're curious to know, did you have any female role models who you looked up to? Who were they? What drew you to them? Well, I think the first female model I had was my mother, and uh, who was a very stern uh, person who wanted the best for her daughter. I, as I grew older and, and recognized uh, the contribution of certain um, Mary McLeod Bethune was one. The high school founder, where I went to high school, I went to small Presbyterian high school, and Mary, uh, Lucy Craft Laney was her name. I might have never knew her, but I might knowing of her. Um, so those two persons were female models. I would say it's like the model for high school and others was neither a female nor a black. It was Albert Schweitzer. You know, I wanted to be a doctor and I wanted to be a missionary. Now, it's a little arrogant to think I could be an Albert Schweitzer, who I never knew either, but I read about him. He's both a doctor, he's both a musician, a philosopher, and a missionary. And uh, I think what also drew, was a motivation for me wanting to be a doctor was a classmate who had polio. So I thought I could grow up, be a doctor and heal her. And I looked for someone similar. And I, as I grew older, I wanted to be active in, religiously in my church or any religion. And I wanted to be a missionary. I wanted to help. So I think those desires or motivations or kind of thing drove me early on to want to go to college. I, I majored in biology with the idea I was going to med school. Um, happened to meet uh, someone who was a senior and I guess I was in my <laughs> medical school, but I went on to get a master's degree thinking I would, you know, go to med school. In fact, really applied and, and got uh, a conditional acceptance to one, but uh, got married and that was the end of that opportunity. Yeah. Can I just follow up, just, to, just so we have it for the record, what was your mother's name and what was the name of the high school you attended? Yeah, my mother's name was uh, Josephine Martin McPherson. I was born to Josephine and Thomas McPherson. I was born in Savannah, Georgia. My father uh, was an insurance salesman most of his life, all of his life that I knew it. And he was a manager of, a comp of the company in Augusta is how we moved from Savannah to it. It was a black insurance company, you see? My mother um, taught school for a few years, but I didn't know her as a teacher. Most of my life I knew her as a dressmaker, and later in her life she became a superintendent of an orphanage. But uh, both my mother and father wanted for me a better life. My father didn't finish high school. I think he probably told me he went as far as, I think, the seventh or the eighth grade. Later on in his life he got what you could get was a certificate but he was a good salesman. We used to say he could sell a tombstone insurance. Already did. He could sell it. Yeah. So that's how he got to be manager of the company. My mother uh, finished what we would call a normal school. Years ago, you could take, in the black community, it, was, it wasn't like a junior college, but it was a little advanced over high school. And you could take... Uh, a test and get a certificate to teach. She never went. She ne formerly never went to college, um, but she was a teacher early in her life. 
When you were growing up, what were the expectations, the societal expectations of what you would grow up to be as a woman? Well, um, a teacher, a secretary, a social worker. Um, that's why I said, um, although I, I don't think I knew a female doctor, to be honest with you. My, my doctor, who was very kind to me, Dr. Otler, you know, most of the doctors I knew were uh, male. So I was out of the norm to want to be a doctor, no doubt about that. Yeah. Then what first drew you to, to politics? You know, I still wonder about that. <laughs> what drew me? I think that I saw within that the possibility that I could help, that I could serve. I can make a difference. Uh, uh, I still think politics is an opportunity where you can um, help and make a difference through policy, in spite of all the, uh, the accolades or descriptions of politicians not being able to negotiate and compromise. I still think it's, it's an avenue for that. And that's what drew me to, to it, yeah. Um, Early on, I certainly didn't look forward to being a politician. But in uh, 1968, uh, I had the opportunity to, to be motivated. Now, I must say, I had the incident in which I was involved in was the opportunity where they really invited my husband as a young lawyer in, in this rural area. And after college and after law school, my husband was invited to come to this rural area to form the first integrated law firm in North Carolina. And um, we went to this rural area. He promised me he was going to this rural area, and we'll stay there for um, three to five years. We have now been there 50 years, so, you know, you can't count on what it, But the community has been very kind to us. But there was a need, and I think we responded to the need, and we fell in love with the rural area. But so early on, he had the opportunity, along with some other leaders, and I think there might have been 12 people in a, in a region of about 10 to 12 counties, uh, were invited to, uh, to consider running for Congress because the registration was very low. In the particular county in which we lived, which is a rural county, the registration was like 15% for Afro-American, and, and probably lower than that in terms of actual voter participation. So the, the invite was not to me, but to him, and I just went along. And in the discussion about the desire and the need to find a candidate who would be willing to um, run for Congress, um, because we needed to have this opportunity. And also, as you know, in 1968, there was a great movement for the civil rights. Uh, Martin Luther King had motivated people, and we were ourselves motivated that indeed this was our time, particularly for Americans, to be seen as equal. And um, I guess I got the spirit, and, uh, and I raised my hand, and, and my husband didn't. And nor did anyone else, really. And so on my way back, I said, why didn't you uh, volunteer? And he said to me, tell me who would take care of our three children and myself if I stopped my law practice and ran, you know. Um, so we knew it was a sacrifice. I mean, no doubt about that. And, and there was no uh, deception on the part of the people who invited these. And said that now, you know, we. We can't give you monies. You're going to have to raise some of the monies, and you have to you yourself and knock on doors and beg at the same time. But we ran early on, and as I would tell people now, I was defeated royally. I mean, uh, it was big time, uh, big time. But in that defeat, not only did I learn and appreciate what this position could do, but also in that I learned and appreciated the needs of people. For the very same reason I wanted to be a doctor, a missionary, I also find that I'm responding to policies based on people articulating their needs. So that was the reason 
that drew me at that time. And then later on, and I went on with my life, and later on when the opportunity came again, when there was redistricting, um, some of the people who I was engaged with actually approached me and said, uh, uh, why don't you consider it? At this time, I was very situated a little bit like my husband in a, in a position and also in a business that had, had to make the election to move from there to, to run. But I did, and um, we were successful. Yeah. In that first campaign, who were some of the people who recruited you to, to run? Vernon Jordan was. It was uh, he. Well, he was representing what they call the Voter Project. The Voter Project was out of Atlanta, Georgia, part of the Southern Regional Council, um, and they not only recruited me. It's not actually they weren't. It wasn't Eva Clayton they were trying to recruit. It was really trying to recruit an individual who was a leader who would be willing to be a candidate who's willing to. Um, motivate people and tell them that voting is, is one way you achieve your citizenship. That, that, that was the accolades that they were in. They didn't knock on the door and say, Eva Clayton, you ought to run. They knocked on the door and said, we need someone to do this, and for these reasons. So there. Also, at the same time, um, they had, there was a black uh, dentist from Charlotte who ran for governor. And we kind of partnership each other. Uh, he was in the west, Charlotte is another part of my state, where I was in the eastern part of the state. And actually, um, three days, I want to say, no, I'm sorry, two weeks before we had a rally in eastern North Carolina, Martin Luther King was killed. Um, he was, uh, he had committed to coming to our, our rally. In fact, a number of uh, states and locations around the South were doing the same thing we were doing in Georgia. Uh, Reginald Hawkins, who was the dentist, had the personal relationship with and Dr. King. I didn't. And uh, I think they went to school together. And so he was going to stop in Charlotte, and he was going to come in Eastern North Carolina. Actually, in Eastern North Carolina, we had probably had a larger contingency of Afro-American and so it was a big, big issue. In fact, I uh, uh, today, I mean, on yesterday, I visited with um, Congressman T.K. Butterfield, who is there, and he reminded me that uh, when he marched for me in 1968, that the FBI was following him. I said, well, if they're following you, I'm sure I got a record, too. So we see what that, but he was in law school then. And he organized a march from law school to come all the way to Wilson. Who have He is from Wilson. And by the way, how life is so related. His father, who was a dentist, uh, gave me uh, free space in an office so we could have a campaign. There were a lot of volunteers. There were a lot of people who were interactive with this activity. It just wasn't me. It wasn't the kind of traditional campaign that I ran in 1992. It really was kind of a community organization, or, 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 or it was a, an effort that came from the spirit that we can do this, and I want to be a part of this. So it was an exciting time, yeah. So there was a long gap between your 68 campaign and then 92. Oh, yes. So what motivated you to run in 1992? Well, um, real possibility that you could win. <laughs> it's quite different from making, making a stand and making a case that we ought to be some. But now the redistricting gave you really an opportunity to run. And also the, um, the people who, who wanted me to run in that area. And, and not to say I was the only can, candidate. There were other candidates as well. Uh, they saw the possibility as well as I could. Uh, redistricting meant that we had the opportunity because of the population demographics that we could uh, we could have that um, real political possibility of winning. Yeah. Who were some of those people that recruited you to run? Um, Wilson, uh, Fitz. Uh, can't remember all of them. Yeah. Fitz was also involved with, with me in 1968, and he, 
approached me again in 1992. And his, fa his son now is Judge Fitz, but it was, he felt that I did a good job then, and uh, he approached me again. In fact, he fits, the father fits, actually managed my 1968. And he said, I'm no longer able to manage, but I want you to run. How, uh, how had that di the district changed in the intervening years? And can you describe the district that you ran in in 1992 a little bit, the geography and the demographics? Well, the geography, and I'm, I'm doing this from memory because I don't really recall. As I recall, the geography was not quite the same. It was not from Durham all the way to the coast because I don't remember ever campaigning in Durham area. The, now, how they changed uh, demographically was to make sure that the geography would encompass a significant number of Afro-Americans that gave an opportunity to win. So at the time I ran in 1992, the demographics and the percentage of blacks that were in there was significantly higher than when I ran in 1968. So in order to achieve that, you had to change uh, the boundaries of that. And so you know, it was 49% um, of, the, of the population when I ran in 1992. That was not the case, and I can't recall what it was, but it certainly wasn't the case. So in order to achieve that, you had to have different boundaries in order to do that. You had to grow in order to have that. But by and large, it was a rural district even though you had a, a small part of Durham, which is urban. It was, it was a part of Durham going all the way to Elizabeth City, to the coast, and went all the way down to, Wil uh, to Wilmington. You had 20 little pieces of 28 counties. I mean, it was, you know, now that I'm over to it, and how in the world did I do that? Oh, better still, why in the world did I do that? But. Uh, 28 counties that we were in pieces of it. Now, look, my little rural county, I lived all of that was in it, right around that area, because it was small, you know, 20,000 people. But you had a little piece here, a little on that area. So all along the Virginia border, going all the way down to Elizabeth City, to Elizabeth City, moving down, and a little piece of Wilmington as well, yeah. You had had some experience in state government before your campaign in 1992, so you served in the administration of Governor Jim Hunt, and you also served on the Warren County, um, you were also Warren County Commissioner. What about these experiences do you think helped you in your campaign and then also in your career in Congress? Oh, I was, I was certainly more mature, and I certainly knew the, the relationship with the state. My experience in the state gave me a feel for the interrelationship between state and federal government. While I was at the state, I was, um, had the opportunity to serve as Assistant Secretary for Community Development, and that had what we call the OEO. I also was involved in Housing Finance Agency. Um, I was involved in community development. Several of those also depend an uh, inter interdependent relationship with the federal government. OEO, if you recall, was a poverty program that they provided to the state, and the state had to supplement that and you know, provide that community. So basically what I was involved in was uh, providing the combination of resources to cities and communities to respond to housing, community development, and infrastructure that was needed in, in, in small towns and cities. Housing Finance Agency was a little different, but it related to also to the state. It was the uh, financial instrument that made housing finance, I mean, housing uh, financially feasible. So it supplemented uh, the, the purchase of homes in there. How, how important in that 1992 campaign was the issue of gender? And how did you approach that? Well, I'm female. That's one, you know. 
I must say I did not raise the issue of a woman against a man, that I as a woman will do this. I raised the issue that I, Eva Clayton, will do this. I was the only female. Um, I also was in a position, because I had some experience, to say that you know I care. Now, if you could translate what I was saying, I have a record and I've demonstrated you I care. I just shared with you what I did with the state, right? I have a demonstrated record, not only have I put myself earlier to run, I have a demonstrated record that I care about rural areas, I care about poverty, I care about you. So I think I was in a unique position because I was the only woman and they knew I was pro-choice, they knew I cared about children, they knew, so I was in a position to say without saying, I, Eva, a woman, I said, I, Eva, Clayton, okay? Now, if I needed to say that, I would. Now, women who were supporting me obviously said, Eva Clayton, as a woman, will do this. Emily's List, who supported me, also said that for me. Uh, and I attracted a number of women groups inside my district and outside my district who knew that the issues I cared about were issues that women cared about and strongly in that area. So gender was there whether I said woman or not, because I was the only woman who ran, and that helped me. Now, if I had two women, I, I don't know what we would, we both were the kid, right? And I would have said, I care more, right? <laughs> and uh, in fact, what I did say is uh, I said, um, we have six, good candidates, but Eva Clayton is the best. Rather than to say, he doesn't do that, he doesn't do that, he doesn't. I just wanted to say, if you want the very best for you, you would choose Eva Clayton. Now, that may have been arrogance, but I believe that, okay? And I said it with the, the best for the first. It became a slogan that we used, wrote it on our t-shirts, wrote it on our cards, wrote it on the plaques. You know, we had no apologies for thinking we were the best. And so a woman was the best in that candidate, whether they wanted to see it or not. How important was the issue of race in your campaign? Very important. But it was evenly split. We had three whites. Let me correct that. I think we had two whites. We had three whites who ran the whole camp, two whites who ran in the primary, and I can't count, I guess. And then three blocks beside myself. So that's, that is six, yeah. Uh, so I made the fourth block to run, uh, and there were two whites in the primary. And then I ran against the white in the uh, the general election in that area. But uh, race was important. Um, I think in the sense that this is an opportunity for a black to uh, be elected. Um, it was also a sense of opportunity. Otherwise, you wouldn't have had four you know, of them running because they saw the same thing I saw in that. Um, and I also think in the sense of um, the response of people voting, whether they voted for me or not. Uh, they, those, we had perhaps one of the highest percentage of voting we had had in that district in 1992 in that area. So it, it, it was a new opportunity, and I think the, the, the electorate saw this as an opportunity, and they wanted to be engaged in that process, yeah. It was a sense of pride.
Uh, nationally, 1992 was called the year of the woman because so many women won election to office for the first time that year. When we're curious to know from your perspective, what factors do you think played into that? Hmm. Well, I think uh, a number of factors, you know. Um, the redistricting um, gave not only Afro-American, but also gave some women opportunity. The Anita Hill um, discussion or argument or whatever you want, a hearing, certainly uh, infuriated or inspired black, uh, women, whether they were black or white, to be engaged in that. I think um, Clinton uh, articulation of uh, equal opportunity of women and equality uh, gave uh, opportunity to that. Uh, and I just think that a number of uh, years before women had tried and this things just seemed to have uh, come together at that particular time. Uh, Twenty, As you know, 27 women came from all over, the largest number coming from California. Um, so it was a very, very significant uh, a time uh, for all of us to come at that same time, yeah. You mentioned Emily's List and some of the other groups that supported you, but how difficult was fundraising for you in that campaign? Oh, it was difficult, yeah. Um, and, and, and Emily's List did support me, and I was very, very, I was helped tremendously. Their support became even more significant in the runoff. Um, because when I actually, at the end of the primary, I didn't have the highest number of votes. Um, Walter Jones' son actually didn't get the 40%. And I challenged him. And at that time, Emily List said, we know even more than we have given you before that we needed. So it was, all, it was really a significant time because we really, it was money against money. It was just, and so um, the call not only from Emily's List, but Emily's List also reached to other groups in that area. So it was very significant. But also Afro-Americans uh, might have put in less money per check but they put more checks in. And so we had the opportunity to, to rally people and tell them, this is the time. If you're going to ever do it, do, you have to do it now. Uh, don't wait later to, uh, to help with the banquet. We need it now. And I, I wasn't very good at raising money, but I, boy, did I learn how to lose my pride and say, hey, I need your help. You know, so it's very significant. And, um, Raising money, unfortunately, has to be a part of the, the effort. I wish we could say it was another way, but that, that's just the reality of it, yeah. And still, I probably, as compared to the amount of money that's raised now, uh, we probably didn't raise as much. And I can't recall exactly how much we raised, but uh, the cost of elections have gone up and up and up. And that are, so money was significant then, it's probably even more significant now, but it was very significant. And it became more significant, obviously, at my runoff than it was at my at the primary. And helpful, to be honest, some of the, you know, my opponents in my primary joined forces with me. You know, I appreciate that. So, you know, it, it pays to uh, be respectful of your opponent as you're going. You never know you may need them down the road, right? <laughs> And they were very helpful, so I'm very grateful some of them did help me financially. What was the most memorable moment of the campaign in 92 for you? You're really trying my memory here, but yeah. <laughs> but a lot of it was. Let's see, what was the most memorable part of my uh, campaign? Uh, well, I'm, uh, it, it, there's several. Obviously, I think the most memorable was when I realized that the opponent didn't get the 40 percent. I must be, that was the most memorable. But there were also other memorable parts of it. Uh, let me just comment on that. Um, obviously, I was 
hoping I was going to lead, right? But if you can lead, you will hope that there was enough not to have uh, the person, whoever it was, get the 40%. So I think just recognizing that I was behind, immediately behind the person who didn't make the 40%. Uh, that was the most memorable part of it. But I think the other part of it was, and this is more general than it is specific, is the outpouring of people to help me. And I think the march I was telling you, the rally we had when Martin Luther King was to come and didn't come, it became more of a memorial, but it, it also was the outpouring of people recognizing this was something bigger than the election. Uh, Abinette came and, and, and I think that actually the rally was larger than it would have been. <clears throat> I can't imagine that people wouldn't have come for Dr. King, but I think that came with a different determination, a different re realization that this was something far more significant than just an election, that we had just lost a giant. And he too saw the value of voting, and so the realization that this made it real for so many human beings, it, you know, kind of brought all of us to a new sense of reality and purpose. But there were a lot of memorable you know, times, uh, you know, you know, there were times when your opponents would try to throw you off cue, you know, it, there, are, there are a lot of things, you know, you have to, you, you become not immune, but you, you, you do learn, it's, you know, you, you take some things for granted, then you realize that these, these guys will throw you a cue as quick as anything, you know, so. This grandmother had to learn very quickly, you know, that they were ever there. So we learned. You served briefly in the 102nd Congress, the, the very end of the 102nd. There were only 34 women who were in the House and Senate at that point. The number jumped to 55 mm -hmm. in the next Congress, but still a, a very small number of women. Did you find that because there were so few of you that you gravitated towards each other during that period? Oh, yes. Where we gravitated, yes. Particularly the, the freshman women did to each other. But also we were grateful that there were those who were still in the House, who were in the House when we came. They certainly served as models to us, and they also gravitated towards us. They also reached out to us to say, here's the real deal, you know. And they told us how important seniority was, you know. You know, being a freshman, you think that because you're bigger than the numbers, you're going to be able to do all these things. We have the great expectation of ourselves. And I think women, I think it's instinctive of women that we can do. I, yeah, I think, I don't know if it's a mother instinct, I don't know if it's a female instinct, but we, we can fix it, right? If it's if something wrong, what's wrong? We, we get, you know. And I think we as, as newcomers of women, we thought we could. And now our, our experienced women colleagues didn't say you can't fix it, but they gave us the real dope, you know, how to maneuver and recognize that seniority trumps most things and how you could interact with the senior members to make sure you got your agenda. You know, so they were very helpful. But 55% only represent 12% of the total. And at that time, I didn't see any woman who was a committee chair. Uh, so at best, uh, we had some who were subcommittee chairs, but none who were full committee chairs. Um, you had um, women who were in the leadership, I think, um, at that point, Nancy was, when I first came, she was not a whip. She became a whip later on. But, uh, so you had women who were in position to be moved up. You had women who were counsel us. And I think the men began to feel the sense of pressure that women, indeed the women caucus, was a more vibrant caucus. You know, sometimes we are members of caucuses and we are members of caucus, and I know I had my name in a lot of caucuses, you know. 
I was on, I was actually the co-chair of the Rural Caucus. I was obviously a member, an active member of the uh, CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus. I was actually the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, in which I gave a lot of leadership there. But I'm saying, you, the, your interest is so diverse, and you, I was a part of Foreign Caucus, Africa Caucus, but the Women Caucus really did caucus. And they not only caucus, but they helped each other on bills. And I think you began to understand that the strength of that. Um, I served on the Agriculture Committee. The fact that I was working in nutrition and tried to get agriculture members to see the value, of, not that they didn't, but they just didn't want to pay for it. That I was, I was fortunate and blessed to have the Women Caucus who indeed helped me to put pressure on the agriculture people so I could get my bill, because they need these same people to vote for the settlement, right? Uh, I, I, well, since I've been here, I've talked to Rosa, and Rosa reminded me how she, outside of the agriculture uh, committee, what made, it was partnering with me and others to make sure I was successful in getting things through the agriculture. So the women, we found ways of connecting, rather, we were on that committee. And I was very fortunate that there were people who would tell me how they could assist, you know, in terms of that. So women were very, very helpful to me, yeah. Did, the that, did that go across the aisle, too? Were these also Republican women that would help? It didn't matter what your party was at that point? Some, some. Actually, it depended on the issue. It depended on the, and in case of hunger, some of them really was in that area. That area, yes. Now, how far some would have uh, some limitation how far they push, but the caring about the issue in terms of um, children or caring about hunger, yes, it should, certainly did. And with that council that you talked about, was there anyone in particular that took you under their wing and, and really tried to serve as a mentor for you? Marcy Captor, uh, and actually I had a good relationship with Marella, uh, that she was the one who helped me in nutrition programs in that area. Um, Barbara Canelli, um, Rosa DeLauro, mm -hmm. very active for the thing. Overall, how would you describe the atmosphere of the house when you were first elected? Was it a was it a welcoming place? Was it a place where you needed to make adjustments? Or well, at first it seemed very welcoming. Yes. Oh boy, we had just arrived, and boy, we we were going to take the place over, right? We, it was very welcoming, and then the reality set. And then you realize we need to make adjustment, and Congress need to make adjustment. Um, yes. So the, after you settle in the euphoria, come down, you realize that not that they were saying step back or go home, but you realize that you euphoria or excitement the first two or three weeks had some limitation as to how far that was going to go. Um, so uh, I think all of us, as we settled down and got our various committees and realized we were at the end of the line, rather we got, regardless of what committee, rather you got your committee of choice, you're still at the end of the line. Uh, and that, you know, there's a peck in, in fact, there's a peck in order how you speak, or even, not even how you put bills in. And I think that, you know, we had, you know, the, what do they call regular order? When we understood what regular order meant, you know, it meant the, hey, you got your little place, whether you're a woman or wherever. So, yeah, I think all of us made adjustment. Um, but the joy of having that number of women coming in together gave us a bonding and a strength that we wouldn't have had if I had come by myself or, you know, I've been isolated a little bit, so there was com there were comforts in numbers in that area. Were there parts of the institution that were easier for women to to join, or conversely harder? Well, if you think about the committees, I think there are committees that are more difficult 
to get on. Now, I ask for agriculture, but agriculture is easier to get on. Not many people want to be on agriculture, woman or man, but anyhow. The, um, and I wasn't sophisticated enough to know which were the most, you know, more powerful, prestigious committees. Uh, and I was advised later, you know, I got elected because a large number, I got elected president of my class. And then later on, my someone came to me and said, "You should be on rules. I asked for rules. Hey, yeah, I asked for them. I didn't get it. You know. So they were obviously knowing which committees to get on would more difficult for women to get on some committees. Now, when we got here, far as structural, um, found out that the gym wasn't accessible to women. They had to make adjustment physically to us." You know, was, uh, was in spite of them knowing that women were here, you would think they would have made a little small adjustment like that. Say, you know, women may want to go in the pool, they may want to go to the gym, you know, didn't do that. Um, uh, structurally, you know, to make sure there are number bathrooms too for women as well as men, they didn't structurally do that, you know. It's, and the private sector was ahead of them, you know, in terms of that. But uh, so, you know, things are slowly changing here. We, you know, regular order means slowly changing. That's what it meant. Yeah. So we really, you know, we finally had that reality of what that meant. Yeah. Uh, you just said that you were president of your freshman class. How did that come about? Was that something you campaigned for, or did no. people recruit you? Uh, well, uh, the reality that women were in a large number convinced several of us that a woman had a chance. And how we really came about, I actually said to, I think it was Anna Escher, you ought to become president. She said, no, I do not want to be president. And she raised her hand and said, I nominate Eva Clayton. That's really how, how it came about. So the, the women were going to get a candidate. And I had suggested Anna. I don't know who else suggested her. And before Anna allowed that discussion go any further, she told the California delegation it was going to be Eva Clayton. And she nominated me. And the reality was, and actually, uh, my friend, uh, Jim Clyburn, uh, wanted to become president, and somebody had nominated him. Proud to this uh, nomination coming from the California delegation. And um, he recognized he's a smart politician, and plus he can count. Uh, he was a smart uh, politician then. He still is a politician. Oh, he wouldn't be whipped. So he understands where the wind is blowing. He, he has a good, a good sense of that. And he proposed that um, let Eva Clayton be president for the first year, and I'll serve the second year. And they accepted his, his, his proposal. And um, so essentially, I served the first term, first year of the term. He served the second year of the term. So I guess we were co-presidents, you know, but, but it worked out for him. But if the women weren't there in numbers, Eva Clayton or anyone else, well, it would, the regular order would have meant the same regular order that a man would be president. Nothing wrong with a man being president, but if you have the numbers and you have the capacity and you have the opportunity, a woman should use that capacity. And you shouldn't step back just to say a regular order. Traditionally, we ought to let a man go forward. What were the benefits of that position for your time in Congress? Well, it certainly had no authority, actually, but it was, for me, a greater sense of visibility and access. I was used a little bit as a liaison between my class, the leadership, as well as the president. And they also <laughs> probably used me to assemble the leadership in a, of my class to vote the party's ticket or the bills that they were pushing. 
you know, um, to have about 40 some members in that class meant you had a significant number of that. Um, so the benefit was access, benefit was visibility. Um, I used that in my push for the black farmers, knowing that I could have access. I made the opportunity available for black farmers to meet with the president. Uh, I, had, I had presented the case to my agriculture committee. They had dismissed it. Um, they did hear it, in fairness to the agriculture committee. They heard it. They said nothing we could do because the statute of limitation is uh, expired um, and you've lost the opportunity to raise the issue. And it was a legitimate issue for the black farmers and it actually was a limitation legally. But it didn't mean that we shouldn't find a way. So the opportunity to have the president hear this case, certainly I used that. I used also access to then uh, Speaker Foley when um, we had a terrible storm down and destroyed all, a good bit of Princeville. Um, we asked him to come to get resources, and he, he did, and it, um, it made a big, big difference to that. I wouldn't have had that. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to raise those issues in that way if I'd, I hadn't had the position. So, yes, I used it, yeah. You've already touched on the Women's Caucus, which you had joined, but how would you describe uh, the leadership of the caucus at the time when you joined it? I'm trying to think who was the chair. Well, the, the, the leadership is, I'm, I'm trying to think who that chair was right now, but actually the value of the Women's Caucus is coming together of the senior members with the junior members who, and many of them were in various committees. And so we could bring issues, or they brought things that they were working on to inform us. So the value of the Leadership Caucus was information. The value of, of the Women's Caucus was uh, connection and support. So we could bring, they could inform us, and also we could bring ideas and acts for advice of that. I can't recall exactly who the person is. Uh, maybe I'll think of it and, and give it to you, but I can't recall right now. We, yeah. we can find that. I think yeah. you're, okay. I'm looking more for a general sense yes, of yes. how it worked in the oh, institution. Oh, it worked very well. It worked very, very well. It was a source of, um, it was excellent source of information. It was excellent source for also inspiration and, and support and support. Some things we had ideas about were good ideas, but couldn't work. And they would, you know, having that experience as someone to tell you they could work. Oh, in, in, in the instance of nutrition or instance of... Now, I didn't bring the issue of the black farmers that much to them, but I brought the issue of nutrition to them. I brought the issue of small women farmers to them in those areas. And because some of them, they were on appropriation. Uh, I didn't know that much about rules and you know how we could get amendments. So it was a great source for me personally in terms of information or guidance uh, in that area. What role did women play in the Congressional Black Caucus? Well, there were 10 of us coming at one time, so that was the largest number they had ever had. Uh, I think there were, two, I want to say there were 27 or 28 members of, at that time. So um, slightly more men than women. Um, the leadership was male, but the um, the vice chair became a woman, and you could see that that was changing. And so eventually we had uh, Maxine became chair. Uh, so there was the gradual that. And women played a significant role in terms of issues, uh, poverty, in terms of justice, 
terms of housing, in terms of um, very much like the Women Caucus, in terms of others who had bills. I, I know I relied on uh, Representative Stokes and Clay because they were senior members and they were, one was on the appropriation, one was on the rules. Um, uh, they were, uh, so I think women began to be not only the voice in, in the face of the CBC, um, I don't think I was the first woman who was the chair of the foundation, but uh, I became chair of the foundation. If women hadn't been in them, I'm sure that might not have happened. Um, but uh, women played a significant role in that, yeah. Did you bring a different perspective to the caucus? Because most of those representatives that you mentioned and most of the people that were on the CBC were from urban districts. Well, I think I did. Um, I'm obviously from a rural area. I'm from the South. And, and at the time, also, was more mature. Not saying that they weren't mature. I, that's, I don't, please don't, I don't mean that in a negative way. I meant that age-wise. That's the only thing. So I... Um, and also, I think I had um, the experience of having governed, having led an administration. And just personally, I probably have a, a different demeanor, you know, than some. And, but I think there was diversity in there. There were many, there were other people very much like me. Uh, when I first came to Congress, one of my closest friends was another person whose name was Carrie Weeks, and she might have been a little more mature age-wise than that. We gravitated to each other, so I would say to us, us old folks kind of go together, right? But I think um, both of us were respected in that area for what we did, yeah. Uh, just curious, you've talked about Agriculture Committee. Can you describe the process of getting on to agriculture and, and who, who you went to for that? And I simply gave my um, request and you, know, you submit your, your party, you submit your preference of committees and I did. I went small business and agriculture. As I said earlier, um, uh, you know, I had uh, advice and I went also for rules but I and they granted me that they granted me both of those committees uh, agriculture I wanted because I came from a rural district I came from a district that depended on agriculture but it's a big factor economically and culturally people think of themselves as a com farming community although I had a small part of Durham I just a very small part of Durham uh, but the bulk of my constituencies were thinking that. And, um, I would tell people that I would work for agriculture communities, I would work for rural communities, I would work hard, not just work, I would work hard for them. And I was particularly for small farmers. Uh, I did, personally, I had very little experience with farming. Other than I like to eat, you know, I, I and I also went to see my, far, my farmers event. Um, I would also say to them that I married a farmer. You know, he's such a poor farmer. He became a country lawyer. You know, and trying to get the farmers to think that you had an advocate in myself. The big um, agriculture interest did not support me. They did one of my uh, opponents. Uh, I mean, big, big farmers, you know, all the, we had a number of agriculture interests in our area, uh, poultry farm, you know, fairly significant that across America were located in North Carolina. Um, but I knew my district, so that's the reason I went to agriculture. And by the way, when, once I won the runoff in, uh, in, in the primary, the North Carolina commissioner came to me and said, in a very patriotic way, uh, young lady to this grandmother, young lady, you do yourself proud if, uh, and your district well, if you serve on agriculture, as if he needed to tell me what to do. But anyhow, 
I did, I did serve on agriculture because it actually was right. And, and he, in his way, he was really, I think he was really begging when I understand what he was doing. Because I think, he, and he might have been right. I would, might have chosen education rather than agriculture because I'm more bringing people up and education-wise and small business. But the realization that my district really needed someone in agriculture. Um, as I said, I knew very little. So I, on agriculture, I learned a lot. And, and by the way, agriculture was an old boy's culture. When I went there, there was one woman. I remember her uh, to this day. Yes, Jill Long Thompson. Uh, was there, for, and she was there for four years, and then she became the assistant secretary for agriculture. And then I think Cynthia Kemp came, and other women came. They came and left. Huh? Uh, it was old boys' culture, both by composition, but also by attitude. Hmm? And they they tolerated me. They treated me as an outsider. I had to prove to them I was worthy of negotiating. I had to prove, I had to win the way that I was worthy of legislating, or advocating for big farmers as well as for small farmers. Hmm? And I had to prove to them I could advocate and legislate even for the hungry. But it didn't take me long to learn how to horse trade. They needed me as much as I needed them because agriculture is such a complex and interrelated, interdependent set of meat. So you, livestock, would need me, who represented peanut farmers, to be with you. And then I had a diverse uh, group, too, in my area. I had the big poultry, I had peanut farmers, I had tobacco farmers, and I had small farmers and the black farmers. And so the issues, and I had a lot of poor folks, okay? So the issues intertwined for me, and sometimes they were, they were, they were areas of conflict. But also you try to use that as an opportunity to get some things done. Um, I eventually, I became the ranking member of um, what was then called Operation Nutrition and Forestry. I think it's called something else now, but anyhow, nutrition is, is, is the main one of it. Two, two issues stand out for me in terms of how agriculture responds to me. The black farmers issue, you know, tolerated, it allowed me to bring the black farmers issues to them, and I appreciate that, right? I'm not saying they knew what the answer was going to be already, but hey, my suspicion is they did, okay? Legally, they were right. The, the statute of limitation had run, huh? But no effort to find out what can we do in spite of that, huh? But once it became a national issue, and also once I had other access to raise the interests of that, then I gathered support among the Old Boys Club, okay? Let's see how we can work this out. Maybe, how about an amendment? Hmm, would that work? And I said, oh, yeah, that'll work, providing you're going to put it on legislation that's going to pass, huh? Not in introduce something you know, put on the floor. And, go. and sure enough, to their credit, they did. But the value of having, both in my own mind, the ability to, not to be suspicious, but just, just to raise the question, what else is going on here? And also, having support independent of your old boys club you're sitting on, okay? So having had you ex earlier about having been president, and now by this time I was no longer president, right? But I had developed a relationship with people, women in particular, but also with the Black Caucus, and also have had the access to the president to give the audience to that. Then when it came to nutrition, the issue there was the um, food stamp. And the issue also was the opportunity, I think, for us on the Agriculture Committee is to extend food stamp to legal immigrants. And we did. And uh, that allowed, excuse me, that allowed um, 
us to consider the same requirements, but to extend this to a new class of people. And that cost money. And we did. Uh, the, the opportunity then to write the farm bill is where you continue the authorization which you've already passed. And the real, you see, the authorizing committee is not the appropriation committee. But the authorizing agent uh, committee is aware that as you open up this opportunity, more money will be required from the appropriation. And, and they were right, food stamp did cost. It's no, just like SNAP now costs a lot. And interesting how things change and become the same. Right now, they're trying to cut SNAP from four people, billions of dollars. Same thing when I was there. We were giving poor folks too much. That's what it, they didn't say it that way, but that's what it meant. But at the very same time, they were asking me, and all members of the committee, would we authorize a buyout for tobacco farmers? Authorize a buyout for peanut farmers? I had tobacco farmers in my district that I wanted to make sure they got all they needed. But at the very same time, they were asking me to do that. They wanted to cut poor folks out, okay? Some of those checks were for $5 million, $10 million. Hmm? An average food stamp person don't get more than $2,000 a year, if that much, depending, depending on the name of the family. Hmm? The audacity to think that I would sit there and allow that to happen. Hmm? My conscience wouldn't allow that. It had nothing to do with being a woman. Huh? But it's certain because there were women in the Congress that I also knew would be supportive long, rather in preparation of that. As I said, Rosa DeLoe was certain there for me in appropriation. She, she was in agriculture appropriation, and so it was helpful. But to you see if I allowed the authority to be contracted, then the appropriation would be contracted. Well, my tobacco farmers, my peanut farmers, wanted their money, right? That got to be a very good negotiating strategy. Mm -hmm. So let's help each other out. Mm -hmm. You help the poor folks, in, and these weren't my district. This was America, okay? I was, so I was advocating for not just in my district, <laughs> oh, my district compared to, uh, I think, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina. Actually, we were, uh, at that time, were certainly not getting the most money because the severity of the poverty and the utilization of food stamp weren't that high in my district, although we had a poor district. So we were actually fighting for poor people in the U.S., and to have the opportunity to do that. So my, my service on the Agriculture Committee, in fact, as I look at it, my, my entrance in the Agriculture Committee, my service in the Agriculture Committee, and even my, my, my members' resistance to me, but finally their acceptance of me. And they did. They did. You know, I earned, I, I wasn't on that drafting committee only because I was a ranking member. I was on there also, I made a contribution. Mm -hmm. Also, the acceptance of me, they're equal, and many of them acceptance of me as their superior allowed me to know that I can negotiate with the best of them, okay? Rather male or female. And so part of, sometimes I tell this to, my children, people I, I, I lecture to, so part of the strength is not just what you do with friends and people who support you. Part of your strength is what you do with people who oppose you and resist you and how you win them over to that. That's, and, and in many ways, the Agriculture Committee helped prepare me that not only do what I do nationally, 
but globally. I became the assistant director general for the Food Agriculture Organization, the largest UN agency in the world. And in that role, I had the opportunity of organizing partnerships and alliances around the world. Twenty-four. I, I was I was both blessed and fortunate to either have nurtured or supported or encouraged 24 different partnerships to fight hunger around the U.S. And I must say, serving on the Agriculture Committee hmm, and the resistance of my male colleagues huh, strengthened me. Huh? Now, should they have done that? Of course not. But hey, but because of that, I think more because of my response to it, my growth up. Now, everybody will not have that same piece, but that certainly was the end result for me, that I was stronger, you know. And I think part two, I came from the South. Mm. So I had come from a segregated community, grew up in a segregated community, knew what segregation was, went to segregated schools, and had to overcome that. So overcoming that helped me also to overcome the male resistance that I had. Should segregation have been there? No, absolutely not. Should male resistance be to there are equal colleagues who happen to female. Absolutely not. And it, were they trying? Were they trying to help Eva be stronger? Absolutely <laughs> not. But hey, you know the result is what the results are. Did that resistance surprise you at all, or did some of those women mentors and other women who had been on the hill for a while did they warn you of that? Did they try? Some to of it. Yes, they did. They did. And also some of them not only warned me, but also told us how to overcome that. You know, some of them said sometimes there are more resistance when they are together than you have one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. In other words, some of them are kinder, more gentler of, of a person when they're talking to you one-on-one, -on -one, but when they're in a group, I'm not sure whether they're trying to prove something to each other or what, I don't know. But you know, if you uh, how to approach them, some of, some of our colleagues knew them better than I, and said, you know, why don't you talk to this person, perhaps, before he gets in the committee. Mm -hmm. So some good specific advice in that case. Oh yes, oh yeah, and we did, we talked, and actually, Interesting. Some, when we talked to some of them, they would tell me how to get to approach their colleagues who were male. Said, "Here's what you say. He's not as bad as you think he is, but it, you know, yeah. you know, he would. Well, anyhow, I would take the advice. I go knock on that person though. And now I wouldn't say John Doe told me you're not as bad as you are, but here you are." You know, you have to find people where they are, you know. But yes, some of the women told, advised us, indeed, that, and now in the agriculture, man, I think that is generally true. We're back with Eva Clayton for part okay. two of our interview. Um, okay. We've asked you a lot about more of the formal networking that women members did, but we also wanted to ask you about more of the behind the scenes and kind of the informal networking. Uh, were there any clubs for women or sporting events or lunches or, or regular events that you could attend? There might have been sporting events that women could attend. I didn't attend them, I must confess. Uh, there were the opportunities, and I took the opportunity where women would go for dinner or, or, or be invited out in terms of that. So I did do that, uh, and sometimes we women would get together and go out. Most time, those were women who were part of the freshman class and we came together with that. Um, informally, too, um, I, um, 
there was opportunity for me to uh, network with churches in that area. I would, I would go home most of the time, you know, I, although my kids were, you know, matured and grown. My husband was back home, but he would come here. So much of my weekends were going there, and we were spent here. But the opportunity when you knew the schedule would allow you, we sometimes, sometimes we as women would gather together even while we were waiting to vote for informal lunch, uh, dinners or something together in that area. The sporting events, I wasn't, unless I was attending, I didn't, I must confess, I didn't go to, yeah. Were there any groups that were male only, just for male members that you or your female colleagues tried to integrate? I don't know them. I'm sure they might have been, but I don't know them, yeah. No, what I do know is the incident about, obviously, the gym. What I do know is the incident where, you know, an elevator, some male said some things to some of our colleagues, and not to them, but to say, you know, uh, imply that you chicks are here, it livens up the place, something of that sort. And I do know about that. In fact, some of those were written up. Um, but I don't know of any Pacific club, at least it's not to my memory, that um, women tried to enter that were denied. Yeah. The, the impetus for this project, as we've told you, is to recognize and celebrate the 100th anniversary of Jeanette Rankin, the first woman right. being elected to Congress. Right. So when she served in Congress, there was a lot of attention that was paid to her dress and her demeanor because she was a woman. She was the first woman. Um, do you think that that changed by the time you came to the House, or do you think that women were treated a little bit differently in, in that regard? Well... I think it had changed, but I do remember incidents where people would make uh, remarks about someone being overly dressed or fashion, really too fashionable for the house. But by and large, most women kind of dress similar, you know. And, and um, but I think it. Had, I think, unfortunately, Rankin was, she had the distinction and the disadvantage of being the only one. So they had to find, they wanted to find something, you know. And she also had the distinction in, as a woman of conscience who had the audacity to vote for peace. So they had to find something wrong with her. But um, I don't think that we, in, you know, at 1993 were that far removed from not being scrutinized for some reason. I don't think the dress was as much the issue as some would say um, demeanor, not you know, not acting with the regular order, not knowing how to conduct yourself, or some would say she's too fashionably dressed for you know the floor or something that sort. But most of us dress very similarly in that area. How would you describe your interactions with the, the press uh, during your time as a member? Do you recall any, any memorable questions that you received from reporters about being a woman member of Congress? Um, I thought the press treated me with um, interest just simply because I became president of the class for a while. You know, I don't think, I didn't, I didn't get a sense they were really interested in me. They kind of raised the question. I don't think they say, how come, but why you? But they, they were, they want it like they, the press has already determined this, this is the year of the woman and they just filled in the blank, oh, she became president because this is the year of the woman. True enough, you know. I thought that the press was a little superficial. I still think that, to be honest with you. But uh, I don't think they did anything negative towards me. I thought they failed to understand the depth of me or understand the depth of women understand that 
uh, had too high expectations of women. In fact, I think we ourselves had high expectations of them. But it, it is enough to say, oh, now you are here, boom. How do you change this institution, right? And we, too, came to make a big difference. But I think the press wanted quick fix. I know the press wanted, you know, flashy pieces. You, you know, you're here today and, boy, everything has changed, right? So they would have a, a flashy report or headline to say. Personally, I thought they were okay with me. I don't think that I, uh, Back home, I do remember um, getting on a press for an issue they raised, I thought, negatively with me. But uh, nationally, I did. Interesting, I had um, an incident to happen to me, not incident, but just an interaction uh, about on Monday before I came. And here, uh, for this occasion, and it was the press person who had covered me in the font farm bill and just incidentally he didn't call me but a friend knew my interest in international sent me a report and I can't remember the, the report's name sent me the, a report that recently had done on EFAT he works for the National Journal and he would he'd be disappointed I can't recall his name but I recall him fondly I want I want to say that um, um, and he said to, oh, my friend said to me, I'm going to share this report with Eva Clayton. He said, Eva Clayton? Oh, I remember her. I covered her in the farm bill. Huh? And she did not get credit for the work that she did. Little will people know of what she did in terms of black farmers or the poor in that area. Now that was that was a press covering me. Now he covered the his his beat is agriculture. Apparently now his beat is international agriculture if he's going to this international piece. And he it's covered the but this EFAT is the International Farmers Advancement Development. It's one of the UN agencies in Rome that he covered. And apparently the director of, of EFAT had come to the United States and requested the Department of Agriculture. And so he was covering. But I, I was just thinking, he is a press person of my past, and I'm coming to talk about women. And he's reemphasizing the fact that I didn't get the full recognition. Now, this is not his word. But he said, look what people know what Eva Clayton did in terms of black farmers of... Uh, all the poor in that area. But by and large, um, I think the press, you know, covered me as well as they probably covered anybody else who either wasn't a chair, you know, that area, yeah. Because there were so few women in Congress when you served, did you ever feel as if you were not just representing your own constituents, but you were representing women in North Carolina and across the country? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I did. And you begin to also feel that your constituents, obviously your constituents come first. You know, you want to say that because they elect you. But when you come to this body, you recognize that you cannot help your constituents unless you also help others. And that as a woman, you found yourself uh, not only coalescing with women here, but also national groups who will bring issues to you. I was probably uh, had as many national organizations coming to me as I had local coming to me from my district. I had, uh, if even if there weren't women, I had I certainly had national women groups coming to me to talk about issues that rather they had an auxiliary or a chapter in my state or in my district. So yes, once you hear, people begin to see you not only representing your district, but also representing the area. And women groups certainly took the advantage of that. And a larger number of women groups are far more active now, but they were active then. And not only in terms of 
endless list in terms of money in trying to raise, but uh, groups who were concerned about health, the groups who were concerned about education, pro-choice groups, all of those groups nationally would, would use the opportunity to lobby all of us as women in those areas and not limit it to where they were located. Was that a role that you embraced? Because that, in a way, sounds like a lot of pressure if you're representing women across the country. Well, um, I eventually did it, embrace it. I didn't see it as pressure as much. Actually, I saw it as an opportunity. Just as I began to see the opportunity of women in Congress helping me with the legislation I want. I um, began to see national, now, do I support all the things that women brought me? No, I couldn't, you know, obviously. But I saw it as an opportunity that I would understand the broader needs of certain issues uh, as they would bring, the, they would be helping me to expand my understanding of these issues. Now, where I would have some pressure, difficulty, if what they were asking me to do, if that was in conflict with issues or uh, positions that I was taking with my district, obviously I would have to make the judgment call on that. Yeah, But I saw that more as an opportunity to expand my understanding, but also to expand my influence. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned a few of the colleagues that you'd served with, um, uh, and we're curious to know, uh, particularly for ones who were in leadership positions, uh, Barbara Kennelly was a chief deputy whip uh, at one point, mm -hmm. and then at the end of your career, Nancy Pelosi became whip. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. what, what were your observations about uh, women like that and their leadership style? Oh. They were very embracing. Uh, my observation is that they were aggressive, they were supportive. Um, when you begin to get in a leadership role, you begin to know that you need the support. So <laughs> they were very supportive. I can, I must say, Nancy was very supportive of me financially in terms of my campaign, and I don't think it was limited to me. I think. She, she was appreciative and understood that um, women had, you know, difficult in that. Barbara Canelli embraced me in birth in terms of advice. Uh, I, I'm not sure I remember too much money coming from Barbara, but she and I were probably friendly than um, myself and, and Nancy. But Nancy came down for me in you know, my campaign. Uh, she was very, very supportive for me. I couldn't, couldn't have asked for more. Yeah, yeah. We haven't talked about the role of staff at all, but were there any women staff from your office or maybe committee staffers that you witnessed um, that really stand out in your mind? Yes, my uh, chief of staff, <laughs> obviously. Uh, she had worked before with other members, and that, that was a big help for me in, in, in that area. Uh, my agriculture staff happened to be a male. Uh, in fact, he ended up being the chief staff for uh, Senator Hawkins and his agriculture when I left, but it was very good. Um, the advantage for me having a female uh, um, staff who was experienced, who knew what regular order meant, but also who had some of the nuances of knowing how things work outside of, you know, the regular order, you know, relationships, you know, that. Uh, that was very helpful, you know. And I think, um, not that men don't have the nuances and you know, things either, you know, I don't want to suggest that they don't have, but being a woman, getting it for a woman, it did, it did help, yes. And what type of influence do you think these women staffers had on the institution? Because there was a growing number of women members, as we've talked about, but also women staff as well. Well, I think the number, the growing number of women members provide the opportunity for the women staff. Not that men wouldn't hire women, but it certainly gave a great opportunity for women to be on that. And I think once they came, 
um, people understood that they were just as competent and just as aggressive and just determined as anyone else. In fact, in fact could be more determined than their men's staff. Even I've had men to tell me that their women's staff exactly were far more determined than some of their male staff they have. So once they're given an opportunity to, to uh, demonstrate what they can do, I think there's no question about their ability to do that. And you begin to see, I'm told, there are a number of women who head up these committees too, not only just chief of staff, but all, also in committees as well. We wanted to, to end today with just a, a few questions, kind of a retrospective section. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe the role that women play in Congress, generally speaking? What do they bring to the institution? Well, I think they bring a sensitivity. I think that sensitivity not only comes from just being a woman, but also some instances of being a mother being a sister, it, 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 we bring some sex, but we bring a more caring attitude. Uh, and also, uh, I'll say in my own instance, I brought a more matured and, and determined and confident that uh, I could handle things. I think they bring a, a sense of I can fix it. Now, that may be a little uh, misplaced around this institution, but I still think having that and that attitude is still better than I can't fix it. You bring a willingness, an openness that it's it's not impossible. We bring a sense of the possibility. We bring a sense of hope. We bring a sense of uh, you can't tell me what to do. I'm here and I got as much right as you have. And I think the larger number of women who come, I think men also are accepting that. And I actually think men accept that. I think sometimes men in certain environment accept different, uh, men in separate environment may act differently in that. Men in their homes know how they accept their wives, right? And they know, and then they come here, and they act different. And even some of the men who come come from corporate America, where women are executives in that. So I think the more that we are here, the more men will act in the same way they do in private sector and within their families. And I also think there is change. I, I you know, I'm, I may be this hopefulness on my part, but I do see uh, our coast committee now has more women than they've ever had, huh? Both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrats on, on that area. So I think you, and I don't want to just uh, say that agriculture is the worst committee, but I mean, I, I was pleased to serve her, and I'm very grateful, as I said earlier. But I do think that, for me, is an example that if men are becoming far more open in agriculture and rural areas, they were becoming far more open in all the other communities. So I think women, uh, well, having women as to the, the democracy, as to the representation, as to the diversity of our society here, and it represents America. We've asked you a lot about being a woman and the role of women in Congress, but what about being an African-American woman? What do you bring to the institution in that, in that position? Well, I asked you brings diversity. Uh, I think all of us who are of minority bring a representation of a sector of America that was not here. I'm pleased to note the increased number of Hispanics and the large number of not large number, but certainly Asian Americans over here. Um, so I think we bring a, a representation of that diversity. And to the extent that Afro-Americans haven't been, or to the extent Afro-Americans need an increased voice as a woman, 
Afro-American women are in society or in a unique role, and sometimes they are playing the only role as the provider in families. Many families are headed by Afro-American women, and they have special needs to be able to articulate what that means, but also to represent the strength of those women because they are indeed providing for those families. We all also want to make sure that they have an equal opportunity in terms of employment and education. And I would say that I can't speak for Hispanic and Asian, but I respect the uniqueness of our culture, the uniqueness of our strength, the uniqueness of even our oppression. All of that needs to be a part of the dialogue and the debate. And to the extent we're here, we have obligation to articulate that or to add strength in that way. When you first came to Congress in 1992, did you feel that you had any extra obstacles because you were a black woman? Well, what I came to Congress with the realization that as a black woman I had to fight harder. What I came to Congress, and I had that, ob I had that attitude before I came to Congress, that if I were to achieve I had to put extra effort in it. And I couldn't take the first response as a response. Rather, I liked it or not. The realization of my development has told me that if I'm going to get from here to here, I can't let your resistance or your first attitude towards me be my determinant. So I came with that. But Congress didn't make that. That's just who Eva Clayton happened to be. And also the culture and the era in which I grew up in, that uh, those of us who achieved knew we had achieved in spite of resistance. Mm -hmm. In some case, because of the resistance, okay? Whatever you want to call it. Uh, so, and also, as I indicated earlier, my mother instilled that in me, yes. Uh, you know, and, and, and both my father and mother wanted us to have, and they sacrificed for I had one brother. And, uh, and they were determined that we were going to college. It wasn't a question. But what they said, that I don't want to waste our money, and you need to do well. Now, I wasn't a student by any means, but I did do well. <laughs> My mother would be, she wasn't living when I came, but um, when I was elected county commissioner, she was, and she's very proud of it. Yeah, she was very proud of that. Uh, yeah. And, and interesting, um, as, you, as you mature, you begin to realize that there's some reflection of what your parents did. Early in the little school I went to, and because of my age and also the segregation, we didn't have a lunchroom. Um, I think kids had food from home or wherever. But my mother became the president of the PTA, and she was insistent that there be a lunchroom. And they made a lunchroom out of a, almost a school closet where they kept books. And she and one other person, they would rotate, and they would give uh, finally, the school began giving oranges and fruit, you know? And that was the beginning of a lunchroom. So part of, part of my evolution to food is my mother. When you first began your career in the House, as we were saying earlier, there were three, 36 women, roughly. Mm -hmm. Before. Before, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe it or not, now there are 108 women in Congress. 104. There, mm -hmm. there, uh, there are most of them in the House, 20 right. in the Senate. Right. And uh, 
we're curious to know, looking forward, because this is a retrospective on the centennial, looking out at the 150th anniversary in 2067, how many women do you think will be in Congress? Do you think they'll reach parity? 67? 50 years from, from 2017, how far out do you think, uh, how, many, how many women wow. do you think will be in Congress? Let's, let's hope that out of 435, is that how many? That we have at least half. How about that? Let's go for the, let's go for the max. We, we, you notice I went to half, right? I didn't even say more, one more than half, right? Hey, half is, it would be great. We, we want to we be here in equal numbers and equal leadership and equal opportunity. What do you think about that? I think that's great. Yeah. How, do you, how, will, how will we get there? Well, <laughs> that's, that's a question. But I think we will get there by instilling in, in women that this is an opportunity. I think you will get there by instilling in women that there will be people to support you. I think the first part is confidence. I think the second part is support. Um, and I think the capacity to do is there. I don't think that's the issue. I think we come as women equally equipped to serve as any man. Some of us not as good as others, some of us as good as others, and some of us are superior than others, okay? So I don't think this capacity. I think it's confident and it's support. Confident that women of capacity would say, this is worthwhile. Why should I go through all this? When I can go to corporate America, I can go to become a president of an institution. Why should I go through all the scrutiny and have to beg for all this money and then be mistreated? Huh? I think there are women who would embrace this if we could tell them, give them confidence that this is something you can do. But, it, but, but not only something you can do, this is something you want to do. This is something you may enjoy. This is something, in spite of the headaches, that you will look back with, with gratitude that you had the opportunity to do it. Because hmm? making money is great, because I wish I had a little more. But listen, making money is not the end of the game. Hmm? So I think those of, and, and I think part of it's women too. We have to, we as women have to say, to other women, hey, it's, it's a headache, but it's a headache worth having. Yes, you have to raise money, but you'll learn how to do it, whether you like it or not. And by, by the way, there are people in institutions and organizations who are willing to give you that money. Now, you may have to, you know, you have to keep calling, you have to keep writing, you have to keep insisting but they will do it. What role do you think minority women will play in this, in the For, next 50 years? Oh, when the 50 years? Mm -hmm. I, well, I think there will be more than double of what they are now. Uh, 16, I believe, there are Afro-American women. 16 or 17, I think there's 16. I think there will more than double what they are. You said 50 years from now? 50 years. Oh, no. They will, they will triple that. Let me correct that. In 50 years, we can do three times better than we are doing now. We ought to do it in proportion to our population. Yes, yes. Now, I, and I think the Hispanics will also. They may outdo the uh, blacks because their population is growing and there's a number of that. But they ought to do it in proportion to the, their, their population, I think. I think you will find far more minority women coming because we are we're growing in population and we're growing in interests. Uh, so I think the opportunity for leadership for minority women will be significantly increased here, both in terms of coming but also in terms of their leadership. Uh, I predict you will have a 
minority uh, speaker one day, hmm? and she would be female. How about that? What advice would you have to no, I mean, I'd be here to see it, but they're going to be here, right? <laughs> We're just curious, what advice would you have to offer any woman who was considering running for Congress? Well, I would suggest that if you're interested to try to study individuals or com ha converse with individuals you know who are here, um, whether male or female, you, would, you need to have a sense of the the kind of personal relationship they see in that. But I, I would suggest that you ought to do your own research before you ought to at least give yourself the benefit that you've researched this like you would research any job that you may want to look at. And what what is the result of serving in Congress? Kind of, you know, the bills mean what? They do what event? What's the end result of serving? What's the purpose of this institution? Why would anybody want to serve here? And then opportunity for looking at what the cost is. Uh, I understand the cost keeps going up, you know, but uh, you need to know that. You need to know that. Um, you need to know the rules of the game before you get in the game a little bit. Um, in the beginning of the interview, we asked about people that served as mentors for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. What about the other side? Did you serve as a mentor for any women members or anyone else that served in Congress? Well, I think I want Adam said, will say to you that, I don't know if I'm a mentor because we're close to age, but uh, will say that I, I assisted her in terms of Congress. Um, uh, some people I didn't know I have supported financial, Sewell and those um, who happen to be related to relatives of mine in, in, in Alabama. Um, we have, um, I, when new members came, I certainly tried to help them. When women came on the Agriculture Committee, I reached out to them, you know. Wasn't successful in keeping them on the Agriculture Committee, but certainly uh, Jill Lawn Thomas reached out to me, and I would reach out to women as they came on the Agriculture Committee. Yeah. Uh, when I served as um, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, um, we would reach out to new members in terms of how to they could get interns and things of that sort in that area. Yeah. Do you think your service in the House? inspired some women to run for Congress or maybe will inspire some women someday? Well, I would hope that. I, that's, I would hope that. I've had people to tell me generally that I've inspired them. I can't say that anyone in Congress has told me that, but I certainly have had people in State House, people who are now presidents of colleges, who are in corporate America. Mm -hmm. Looking back on your career, was there anything unexpected or surprising to you about your time in the House? Something you you didn't think on the front end <clears throat> would happen? Well, I didn't think I'd become president of a freshman class. I hadn't I didn't I didn't campaign for that. I'm glad it happened. I wasn't prepared for the long schedule. I must remember as I said earlier, you ought to look into the rules of the game. I certainly didn't do my investigation there. You know, I thought more that, you know, you'd be out by 8 o'clock, sometimes you're 12 o'clock, and I wasn't prepared for that. Um, some of the perks I knew nothing about. My husband certainly enjoyed the fact that we could, we could travel, you know, in that area. Um, the... Um, also, um, I didn't, I, I'm a good Democrat and, you know, I'm strictly a party person, but I wasn't prepared for the kind of 
demarcation between Republican and Democrat as strong as, as it was. Um, and in fact, interesting, when I first registered, I registered as a Republican. My parents were Republicans. And uh, now I quickly learned that if I will be in, in fact, my husband and I both uh, registered as a Republican uh, when he's in law school. Uh, but when we moved to this rural area um, to participate, we, and I am a, am, am, I'm a Democrat all the way, I don't want to make you know, the, the demarcation of that, but early in, in, in the black community, many of the older blacks uh, were related, all uh, felt an obligation and, and, and appreciation of what uh, Lincoln had done, and that's the reason why they were, I think that's the reason why they were Republicans. And they were, so you had many of those who registered early in their lives, you know, were, and that's the case of my parents. So, so I saw kind of both sides of it, and, and neither Republicans or Democrats were that embracing when I was growing up as to blacks. I mean, you, it was just what party you were in in terms of that. So I was a little surprised how strong those, you know, party. But I, fortunately for me, I had the ability of. Uh, um, being able to communicate on both sides, you know, the aisle. it has nothing to do with my having been a republic. It just has something to do with my demeanor. Um, you know, to achieve something, I I know I have to talk to people I don't agree with, okay, or people who don't agree with me, or people who, you know, are not in necessarily in my party or necessarily in my church. That I want to get people. So it was surprising how much of Deepak take, how that was departed, and how the division were in that area, yeah. What do you think will be your lasting legacy in regards to your house service? Mm. I would think my role in nutrition, yeah. I had one of the, the uh, comments that Alma Adams shared with me, there's her first, uh, she's on agriculture committee now. And by the way, she represents more of an urban area than I did, but she's on agriculture and the education. Her first committee meeting that uh, she was at, um, the ranking member of agriculture said to her, I hope you can uh, uh, fulfill Eva Clayton's legacy. Interesting, so, there you go. I, I just had a, a follow-up question because this came up in the conference yesterday. Okay. In all three of your prepared remarks, when we were talking, and it was the the partisanship in the House, and and how Congress has become much more partisan over the last three decades, particularly. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious to know what you think the the role of women is in that kind of environment. Mm. Can women make the Congress less partisan? I would hope so, but I don't see that happen right now. I, you know, I'm a, it happened, it was less when we were there. Um, and, um, but it seems to be more now. I don't know if it's m as much of a female issue as it is an ideology issue. I think it's more of a political issue, and it's not just Republican Democrats, it is the ideology of the extreme that says, I, and, 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 and I may be misjudging this, but from where I sit, it seems like there is conflict within, and it may be extreme in both parties. You know, it may be, maybe we have extreme liberals, I don't see that. But I think there is the pulling away of the traditional Republicans that were here, and therefore that is why you have probably less communication across the line because they have them communicate within. For instance, I shared with someone that um, 
that um, John Bain is someone I know, I think I know, or whatever, you know. I think he was on airplane my first one that he got off to. But anyhow, we've traveled together on, on, on the trips to made across the sea. And I came back, I think it was for the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights two years ago, like yes, I'm not sure when. But anyhow, I came back. I happened to see him, and uh, he looked over. Eva Clayton, that's John Boehner. So I ran, I got out of my seat, and he came out and hugged me. My friend who was with me took a picture of it, and she said, Eva, I'm going to blackmail you back home with nobody. <laughs> she said, you hug John Boehner? And so I said, this is probably going to blackmail John Boehner and his party. You talk about you better not I hope you don't recall this video. Hey, so I think it's, you know, that kind of, you know, stiffness that allows it. And I think it's more of a, more of a pulling to extreme on either side that doesn't allow you to be human beings, you know, it's, it's something there. So. But I think women are more open. And I, and I also think even those who, uh, they may be extreme in the Republican Party, if you could get to them, now this may be, again, my ego, but I think if you can get to them, I think you could bring, I think they would care about the same issues. I think you can make them see the value of them working together because they do care about the same issues. They do care about children. They do care about family. In order to do that, we have to give each other. But because you're standing in a group over here, whether you're women or men, you have made up your mind that you're not going to budge, right? Now, Eva Clayton believed that she could get some of them to budge. That's, and I think it's not a Eva Clayton. I think women, too, if they could get to them. If Democratic women and Republican women could come together individually and then wanted to, they would begin to see the commonality and see the, the, the reality and the advisability of doing working together. Hmm? But this artificial barriers that in order to be perceived as strong, hmm? Nobody gets anything done. Who, tell me, who wins in that? Help me understand. Who wins in that? Huh? The Democrats have to give, and the Republicans have to give. And I think women have the ability to make the case for common sense, just as we do in our families, when we bring them around the table. Hmm? That's... That's who we are. That's the sensitivity. I mean, our kids are getting out of order. Even they get out of order, sometimes they get out of order is 40 and 52. You have to bring them together. Hmm? You know, the folks say, you're never too old for me to tell you what to do. <laughs> hmm? Common sense makes sense. And women have the instinct. I think God has given us that instinct. And those of, us, those of us who are not shy in telling mature people what they ought to do will do that. Now, those who, it ain't my business, huh? And they're not going to listen to me. Well, whether you listen to me or not, I'm going to tell you, right? Hmm? That's just... I'm going to put it on the table. Now, now you, you can walk away from it now. You're going to get it. Now, that's what I tell my children. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I'm not into the business of I told you so. I'm going to tell you now. It makes most sense for you all to work together. Huh? Well, same thing goes for Congress. It's just, you know, same thing. Same basic principles are in life regardless what you do, hmm? maybe in different politics, or family, or corporate America, that you have to find a way. You find a way to making progress by understanding that you don't do anything by yourself. You make progress indeed if you find the ability 
to get the strength of each of us and work. And I think women have that ability to make the case for that. And I think women respond to women too, whether you're Republican or Democrat. And you know, that's the, uh, the matriarch in us suggests that. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? That's all we have for our questions. I'm going to end the sermon on that. <laughs> I <laughs> felt like I was preaching, but I apologize for that. But anyhow, um, I, I have great hope for this institution. And so I want them to come to their senses and be the great institution they're designed to be. And I think women can be a part of that, bringing that, that sensitivity and that potential. Well, we thank you for spending time with us. This yes. has been delightful. Well, thank you.